listening to the Lagarde Ecossais podcast. In this episode, we examine Chapter 2, Leith, London and St Malo. This episode will focus on London during the 17th century. Hello and a very warm welcome to the Lagarde Ecossais podcast. This is the official podcast of the Lagarde Ecossais novels, hosted by me, Dr Kirsteen McKenzie. The men in the book are entirely fictional, but the times and events they lived in were real. In this podcast, I will tease out fact from fiction for you, and in doing so, I hope to introduce you to this fascinating period of history. The book is available to buy from Amazon, Kobo, Apple Books, Google Books, Waterstones in the UK, and Barnes & Noble in the US. It is also available from many different retailers in Europe. See the website www.legardecossaise.net for further details. I am so glad that you have taken the time to join me today as I discuss the novels in greater depth and the historical events which inspired them. This podcast is for those of you who are enjoying the novels and those of you who want to learn a little bit more about the history behind them. This podcast is also for students studying early modern history courses at college or university. Indeed, the novels purposefully cover many key events of the 17th century, events that are covered in many survey courses on the early modern period. I like to think of the book as a textbook for an early modern history course masquerading as a historical fiction novel. The podcast will closely mirror the contents of each chapter in the novels and explore the real people and events mentioned within them. The podcast is also available as a video cast on YouTube with interesting and helpful visuals. There are also subtitles for those of you who are hard of hearing. You will find transcripts of these podcasts on the Lagarde Ecossais blogs, as well as links to further resources. Please visit the website at www.lagardeecossais.net to take a look. Let's begin. The London which Robert Meldrum visited in 1672 was a vibrant, cosmopolitan, commercial, industrial and financial centre and was one of the most populous and industrious centres in Europe. Bustling and narrow streets housed over 300,000 people. It was also the centre of political power in England. London was England's capital and it is important to remember that Edinburgh was still the capital of a separate and sovereign Scotland at this time. Dublin was the capital of a separate sovereign Ireland. London, Edinburgh and Dublin were the three centres of commercial and political power in the three Stuart kingdoms. They shared the British and Irish crown as all three capitals were ruled over by the same monarch, but all three capitals and centres of power had their own political structures and relationship with the crown. After 1660, the English coronation of the British monarch became the British coronation and successive monarchs have chosen Westminster Abbey for British coronations ever since. The British monarch and its government were based in the Palace of Whitehall, London. The English Parliament was based at the Palace of Westminster, but it was very much an English Parliament, as Scotland and Ireland had their own parliaments. London was also a centre of banking, industry and commerce, and it is during the Stuart era that the international and national banking systems began to emerge. In the first decade of the 17th century, the Dutch established the Amsterdam Bank and Stock Exchange, which stood alongside the Dutch East India Company, the VOC, a major global trading corporation. In 17th century Europe, the United Provinces became the major commercial power at the expense of the Spanish, who had dominated the markets in the 16th century. Amsterdam was a huge commercial hub, drawing in traders from all over the world who dealt in raw materials and were selling commercial and luxury goods. London had established its own global trading company, the East India Company, two years before the VOC in 1600. In the early decades of the 17th century, London became a commercial centre for luxury goods and raw materials. And although there was a royal exchange for the import of raw materials and the exchange of luxury goods, unlike Amsterdam, the development of the banking and financial structures did not emerge until the late 17th and early 18th centuries. London was the major industrial centre of Britain, but there were other urban centres of industry in Britain, such as Norwich and Norfolk and Ashton-under-Lyme in Lancashire. These cities usually specialised in a major industry, such as luxury cloth in Norwich and wool weaving in Ashton-under-Lyme. 
Smaller villages such as Shepshed in Leicestershire focused on stocking weaving. In rural areas and villages, industry still took second place to the tilling of the land and the sowing of the crops. By way of contrast, London supported large international industries with multiple links across the world. Key industries in London during the 17th century included needle making and cloth finishing. There was also a large publishing industry full of printers, publishers and booksellers. There was also a large shipbuilding site at Deptford where ships were built for the navy and for the trading of goods. There was also a large weaving industry in which Huguenots played a prominent role. London was a major global hub which attracted people from all over the world who settled in the city during the 17th century, thereby helping it to become the city it is today. It was also a melting pot of different races, cultures, religions and nationalities. Whilst viewing the city from his boat sailing down the Thames, Robert Meldrum may have seen a variety of people including the following. The Huguenots. The Huguenots were Protestants from France and the Low Countries who began to settle in London as far back as the 16th century. A French church had existed for over a hundred years by the time Meldrum visited London in 1672. The Huguenots opened up links between France and London, not just the woolen trade, but silks and other luxury fabrics too. By the latter half of the 17th century, London became heavily influenced by French fashions and this led to the establishment and growth of London's own fashion trade. Another group that settled in London during the 17th century were the Jews. In the mid-1650s, Oliver Cromwell clarified the legal position over Jewish trade and settlement in England since the formal expulsion of the Jews during the reign of King Edward I. Many of the Jews that came to settle in London came originally from Spain and Portugal via Amsterdam. As historian Marguerite Wilson has stated, many were merchants who exported fish and imported currants. They also became members of the Royal Exchange, buying in raw materials and selling imported luxury goods. The Jewish community was centred around its synagogue in Cree Church Street, London. Another group that settled in London during the 17th century were the Scots. The Scottish community in London during the 17th century was not large by any means, but probably numbered less than 35,000 people. English sensibilities were sensitive to Scottish migrants after the Union of the Crowns in 1603. There were fears that poverty-stricken Scots would come to London in their droves after James I ascended the English throne, but these fears were largely unfounded. Scottish people could be found at all levels of London society. Two Stuart monarchs, both King James I and King Charles I, were born in Scotland, and there were also, of course, the courtiers. Many Scottish courtiers were given favour by King James I, which unsettled English opinion. There were also Scots who worked in the trades in London as blacksmiths, glovers, fishmongers and farriers. Another group that settled in London during the 17th century were the Irish. The Irish could be found throughout London society where leading Irish peers spent time at court, including their Earls of Antrim, Desmond and Kildare. As Toby Bernard has stated, the Irish in London could be found in various professions, such as academics in the societies such as the Royal Society, or they could be petitioners to Whitehall. There was a very distinct Irish Catholic community at the Inns of London, where Irish lawyers were trained for their legal practice in Ireland. Irish labourers were attracted to London too, via the London companies in Ulster. Other communities which settled in London during the 17th century were the Ottomans and the Africans. There were already long-standing and centuries-old links between London and the Ottoman Empire, particularly through trade and diplomacy. The Levant Company traded in raw materials and luxury goods from the Mediterranean and North Africa, and men from the Ottoman Empire came to trade in London. Likewise, London's links with Africa had a long history, but as Peter Fryer comments, it was not until 1621 that there was evidence of black people being bought and sold in England. Many Africans living in London and the rest of Britain could be found as pages and laundry maids. So Meldrum sailing up the Thames would have seen a bustling cosmopolitan city.
Whilst Robert Meldrum is sailing up the Thames in his water taxi to Lambeth Palace, he recalls some of the most momentous historical events to take place in London, as well as some of London's most historical landmarks. Robert Meldrum first comments on the Tower of London, seeing it as an impressive fortress built by William the Conqueror, which held, in his opinion, the most notorious of prisoners. Some of the prisoners were awaiting execution, such as Anne Boleyn, the second wife of Henry VIII, who was eventually executed on Tower Green, and Simon Fraser, 11th Lord Lovett, later executed at Tower Hill for his part in the failed 1745 Jacobite Rising. However, not all prisoners were executed and not all were notorious. For example, Princess Elizabeth sent to the Tower by her sister, Queen Mary I. Princess Elizabeth later became Queen Elizabeth I. The Tower of London was also a place of interrogation. Guy Fawkes was brought here after the failed gunpowder plot in 1605. Meldrum is drawn to the story of Colonel Blood and his audacious heist of the crown jewels from the Tower of London, noting that it was the talk of the Edinburgh coffee houses. In May 1671, Colonel Thomas Blood seized the crown and orb from the Tower of London. Blood was an Irishman who was sympathetic to religious dissenters and English Republicans, rallying against Charles II's renewed Anglicanism. Blood already had a career mired in conspiracy and murder, and a few months previously he had tried to abduct the Duke of Ormond. It came as a surprise to many, including our very own Robert Meldrum, that when Blood was interviewed by the King after the event, Blood was released and pardoned. Perhaps a deal was struck behind closed doors, because for weeks afterwards, Blood was known to have spoken to fellow English Republicans and asked them to accept the King's government. The next event that Meldrum comments on is the Great Fire of London in 1666. We will explore the subject in much greater depth in another podcast, but Robert Meldrum makes mention of a fire which devastated large parts of London in September 1666. He noted while sailing up the Thames that the old and the new became visibly apparent. Here he is writing about efforts to rebuild London after the fire. The Great Fire of London in 1666 scorched 395 acres of the city and over 13,000 houses were destroyed. Other buildings that were destroyed included St Paul's Cathedral, 87 other churches, four bridges and goods worth over £3.2 million in the 17th century. The rebuilding of London took much time and effort, and it is here that Meldrum's memory becomes muddled. He mentions the Dome of St Paul's and the French and Italian influences, which did not become apparent until a few years later. Clearly, he was mixing up his recollections with a later visit to London. This is the first historiographical Easter egg within these novels. This false recollection was a deliberate mistake by me, the author. As a historian, recollections of events, particularly those written by people many years after the event, can become hazy and errors are made. This is a recurring issue with primary sources and testimonies of the time. Historians must constantly assess sources for such errors. Meldrum also recalls seeing the Palace of Westminster from his water taxi. The Palace of Westminster included St Stephen's Hall, where the English House of Commons sat, and Westminster Hall, where the trials of King Charles I and William Wallace took place before their respective executions. Note again the issues of biases here. Meldrum calls King Charles I, King Charles I the martyr. This was a common Anglican and Episcopalian view of the execution of Charles I. They saw Charles I's execution as murder and echoing Charles I's own point of view that he was a martyr for the Church of England. Of course, another issue of bias is also present, as Meldrum notes that it is in Westminster Hall where William Wallace was tried, and this would have been particular interest to a Scotsman like Meldrum. I doubt this would have been of interest to his English contemporaries. Meldrum also notes seeing the banqueting house from his water taxi. The banqueting house at the Palace of Whitehall hosted the execution of King Charles I on the 30th of January 1649. The Palace of Whitehall was far more extensive than it is today, as it was the primary royal residence in London. On the London skyline, the banqueting house could be seen towering over the other buildings. Meldrum also discusses Lambeth Palace, as this is where Meldrum's journey on the Thames ends, and where he alights to meet the Archbishop of York, who is apparently in London meeting the Archbishop of Canterbury. Lambeth Palace was, and still is, the official residence of the Archbishop of Canterbury. 
Meldrum is taken to the Lollard Prison in the Lollard Tower for his interview. The Lollard Prison was used as a prison in the 16th century, and by the 17th century it had retained many of its prison-like features. This would have been a very intimidating place to have an interview, particularly if, like Meldrum, you had a dark secret which had surfaced from your past. The sound effects are provided by the following Og Sound FX Medieval City Sample at Freesound Barry Dowell Porto Better at Freesound Clank Beeld Choir Singing Sor Avi Cari at Freesound The podcast theme tune is provided by Ionix Music This podcast is the copyright of History Gateway Limited, UK